The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode 127. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Make it so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the Discovery episode, the latest Discovery episode called Forget Me Not. Joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? Very well, thanks. Uh, folks, remember to like The Secrets of Star Trek on Facebook, where we're at facebook.com slash starquestmedia. Be sure to retweet us on Twitter, where we're at SQPN, and and engage with us in our in social media accounts. Uh, uh, you have something fun to do online in your social media these days. It's nice to have something uh, fun like talking about Star Trek. So uh, let's talk Star Trek. This latest episode starts, it's the third episode of the season, and it starts with Dr. Culber, Hugh, um, giving a, a, a chief medical officer's log, I guess it is. Uh, Except he's not. It's, it's just sort he's of not talking. not the chief medical officer. Yeah. Oh, he's yeah. not. I thought he he's was. He's just a doctor. Oh, okay. He acts like the chief medical officer at many points. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's actually the woman doctor that we yeah. see who's the chief. I guess because he'd been dead and came back that she had become well, no, the I chief. No, I, I think he never was. was. never was. Really? Just no. like Stamets has never been the chief engineer. He's always been a, a civilian contractor. Oh, right. We, oh, that's uh, um, Janet Reno is the chief engineer, I guess, right? Or she, these days, these I, apparently, days. or an engineer. Yeah, they haven't yeah. really established who the key crew are. Well, and that's a, an interesting thing about this is we've we've not established apart from captain and first officer, we've really not established a structure or hierarchy on this ship. It's very unmilitary ish in mm -hmm. in many ways, and very unlike previous well, Star Trek. Um, and in fact, it's going to come out where, um, oh, what's her name? The the the. The, per, the one with the prosthetic on her face that Detmer Detmer uh, she calls herself the pilot of the ship yeah. and who piloted this yep. and oh you know she's macho like a pilot I'm like you're 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 not a pilot you're a helmsman like that there's a difference yeah. <laughs> between those two things it's kind of odd like the people who are writing this don't really understand how a hierarchical military style, even Coast Guard, it, which and is, it could, it, yeah, it could be a conscious choice too. I mean, they could consciously yeah. be saying we're gonna we're gonna kind of change this up, where we're really not gonna have an explicit chief engineer, or if we do, because I, I I do recall they've mentioned a chief engineer, yeah, but we're really not gonna make a big deal out of it, right? Uh, well, there's a whole another thing that comes up later where, where like everyone takes the day off, and it's just very un, you know, starship ship running a ship. Like, but we'll we'll get mm -hmm. to that, I guess. I, I'm I'm kind of jumping ahead. Anyway, Doctor Hugh is having his his log about the set, the loss and sense of disconnect that everyone on the ship feels for having left everyone and everything they ever knew behind a thousand years, and they're alone in the future without anything. And I get that. That's that sense of loss. There would be a, there would be a huge sense of loss. Uh, and and he points out. The Starship crew is a would be a crew of overachievers. Like they'd be the top, the best. Although every I, I like lower decks because not, they're they're the the underachievers of Starfleet. Well, <laughs> but well especially every, especially this particular Starship because it was supposed to be like the elite science exploration true. ship. You know that you know so everybody who's on there is going to be the the top of their class in whatever science field or engineering field that they were involved in. Right, and so. They because they're these type A overachievers, th they're even more vulnerable. They're even more uh, uh, injured psychologically, emotionally by this sense of loss and unable to fix it because they they're that sort of fix it types, which it, it sounds familiar to me, like the things I've heard about, like at MIT, the, uh, where mm -hmm. they have a, a lot more trouble for 
uh, when students start to fail, they have a lot more trouble dealing with it because they everyone at MIT was always the best student in their school, yeah. uh, their high school. Uh, so well, they're not used all, to failure. We've all had those. We've all had those classmates, whether it's like in you know elementary or high school or into college, where their life is over if they get anything less than an A minus. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, and they're li- and they literally cannot cope. I mean, I even remember guys at seminary that literally they went into meltdowns if they got a B. And I'm sort right. of going, hey, C's get degrees even at seminary. <laughs> That's right. Someone has to graduate at the bottom of the class. You still graduate. <laughs> So, uh, and then we're told that uh, five words keep everybody going when we find the Federation. And I'm thinking, and then what? Yeah. <laughs> and then what? Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, that's not going to be enough at that point. Uh, then we are, uh, we, that after that, we were told that uh, Adira doesn't remember. Uh, so Adira is the young woman who just joined the ship, um, who's a human carrying a trill symbiont. And she's telling uh, the, us that, she doesn't remember how she got the symbiont. She doesn't have any memories of that. She woke up in an escape pod and has no memories from before that. Which uh, is not credible. And I'm going to have a list of, <laughs> for the end of this episode, of the not credible statements that are made about this character. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's not credible that you'd have no memories uh, from before. Okay. And yet end up in this situation. And, right. Because right. she then joined the Earth Defense Force with no memories of a previous life, really? And yeah. a- and they didn't scan you? Well, I, I don't want to anticipate, so yes. we'll, we'll get there. Well, oh, we should also yeah. just point out something that has been said is that she was looking for Admiral Tall. So she has at least had mm-hmm. that memory of there being an Admiral Tall or that she needs to no, find. She knew that she was Admiral Tall, but didn't know much more than that. Right. 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 I guess that's it. Yeah. Anyway, she was looking for a Federation ship. Right. So Hugh suggests going to Trill to deal with this, which is logical, um, because there's never been a human host. And I'm thinking, well, oh, right. Not that that they know about. Well, at that point, there hadn't been because Riker does become a human host for a Trill. But that's in TNG, which is years later. So Okay. Uh, Like the next century or 800 years ago. (laughs) Time you (laughs) went. So the, uh, the they get there and the, the they they get to trill. They're very excited. The burn had decimated the symbiont population because apparently there were a lot of symbionts on board starships. Uh, so mm-hmm. any symbiont that returns home is a cause for celebration because they are the bears of their cultural memory. Yeah. And before we get there, though, there are some additional plot threads they start laying down. One of them is. Uh, Saru goes to Stamets and tells him, figure out for some way else to fly the spore drive now because yep. you can't be the lone navigator anymore, right, which makes right. sense. He points out in the post-burn era, the spore drive is an even more critical resource and it can't just all rest on him because what if it, something yep. happens to him? Right. Um, Need a backup. Also, yeah. Also, uh, Culber <clears throat> goes to... Michael and says, hey, why don't you go down to Trill with Adira? Because he was supposed to go with her. Because he mm-hmm. was supposed to go with her. Yeah. And and he, he, he thinks that, oh, she doesn't need a doctor to go with her. She needs someone to be supportive. And the two of you will have a bonding healing experience after your respective traumas. And OK, the writers are all trying to explore psychology here. But I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a human with yeah. an alien organism inside of her, there needs to yeah. be a human medical professional down there to speak to the medical aspects of the experience since they're right. trying to get the two systems working together biologically. Yes. And so Culber should have gone. Right. But he notices that Michael has loosened up since she's been away for a year. And once more, we get it's like an opera, you know, in an opera. When characters are noting something, they sing about it and they repeat <laughs> it. So it's it, I feel like we're in an opera yes. where everyone is going, Michael is so different. She is so different. How you noticed how different now Michael is now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's true. It just it, keeps keeps coming up. Well, let's, and, let's and hammer I, that I home. think with good reason, because that was one of the biggest complaints about Discovery was Michael right. Burnham is the center of attention and she's not the most likable character. Yeah. See, Although, she's, of course, likable this, now? This whole, scene, <laughs> this whole scene basically reads of we need to get Michael Burnham on the planet. Right. 
Right, it's a board I mean, that's basically all it is. Yeah, it's fine. Michael but Culber should have gone too. Right, you, there's no reason you can't have the three of them go. Like this, <laughs> like why only there's two? Not, a, not enough right. room in this big shuttle that can hold yes. fifteen people or whatever. Well, there's also, a whole other. Why not beam down? Like why? Uh, do yeah, and all, also paint by numbers writing. Why don't doesn't Saru tell them that the Trill host we need help for is a human? Right. Yeah, exactly. That could yeah. be helpful. Maybe they want to dig up some records before we come down. Right. That way they can surprise them. I mean, it's just we, we've we've written it this way in order to create drama, which is but we've lo- I just hate this. Like we've made an illogical I made mean, the characters seem illogical in order to create drama. So we've made them yeah. take a shuttle down so we can have the drama mm-hmm. of of Burnham and Adira walking dejectedly back to the shuttle instead of just boop beam us back up you know it's like yep. we have creating false you know false drama yeah. moments that that is paint by numbers yeah um, there's a whole class of sherlock holmes stories that i guess conan doyle was writing when he was less inspired um where the entire mystery would fall apart instantly if someone didn't irrationally withhold a piece of information yeah until way late in the story examples include the sussex vampire and the yellow face it's like both of those would just collapse immediately yep. if the sensible thing had been done at the start of the story right right and that's that's the that's in evidence here so exactly. colbert tells he he gives this um Speaking of psychological mumbo jumbo, he gives this theory of post traumatic growth to to uh, Burnham about like trauma po- can can not just it's not just to create stress post traumatic stress, but it can also inspire us to evolve and live our lives in a different way. And so you're gonna help her, and he also accuses Burnham of being a responsibility hoarder. Um, mm-hmm. I guess which uh, okay, <laughs> uh, then. <laughs> Uh, they she they take the shuttle down and then Kahlberg now goes to Saru to talk to him about the crew's stress levels. So they're physically healthy, but their stress levels are off the chart. They need to feel connected to something beyond themselves, beyond the ship. Like and they matter to someone. there's our other theme. Yes. For yep. this season. So uh, on the surface of the planet, the Trill freak out over Adira being human. Uh as, as I, my note says, maybe someone should have told them ahead of time instead of surprising yeah. them. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the trill that they meet uh, sees Adira. He's the head of he's the guardians, so he's in charge of the symbiont program or whatever they call it. He's sort of a religious or spiritual leader. He sees Adira as the future of trill because there aren't enough potential hosts. Now, this is a, a problem that's that deals with continuity mm-hmm. because. They established back in Jadzia's day that the Symbiont Commission has been lying to the Trill population about the number of um, Trill that can host the right. Symbionts, um, and that it's va- so there was there was too much demand back mm-hmm. in the day and not enough supply. So right. they they made the uh, Symbiont hosting program artificially restrictive. In order and lied to people saying only a tiny percentage of Trill can actually host a symbiont when the fact was almost I mean, a huge percentage, like half or right. more of the population could host a symbiont. Mm-hmm. And this is the reverse of the situation now. And they try to say the burn was what changed this, that the burn caused a death of lots of Trill who could host a symbiont Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and why is not clear because the burn involved dilithium going boom right so in in, unless you had more than half of your population that just happened to be the potential hosts on starships that went boom there's Mm -hmm. no reason why the the potential hosts would would die right as a result of the burn and now they're making it sound like we've got a surplus of symbionts and this is a huge crisis for our race. Why? Because they can live outside of a host. Why well, can't they just leap around in their pools until your population recovers? And in fact, they kind of they're trying to have it both ways because they, they had previously said we don't have like we've we have a dearth of symbionts 
you know that mm-hmm, having mm-hmm. having one come home is a big is a big uh, celebration for us so which is it right. do you have too few or too many symbionts for the number of posts mm-hmm. you have so now, yeah. now with with the issue of hosts i, I kind of took that of you know after 800 years 900 years however long it's been since ds9 era that they had taken that lie as quote unquote gospel truth that there really are only certain trill that can do this you know, uh, you know, and and part of that is, of course, there's the one character who is the religious religious conservative. You know, right. Of course, he's got to be the evil religious conservative uh, that's fighting against the idea of having the human trill. It's an abomination. Symbiotic relation. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that that's kind of the way I took it was, you know, it, that, yes, the truth came out, but then the truth has been lost again. So I don't, and I don't know if they're going to play it that way or not. Yeah. Who knows? So the- yeah, I just I found it confusing. I did like though the the point that one of them makes when Adira is saying it's a part of me. You know, she's defending that no, I am joined. It's a part of me, and it's like, wait, what? It's a part of you. Yeah, because if if this merger had been successful, you would be a part of it in your mind, right? And just calling it an it, you know, that idea of like thinking of it separately, yeah. Uh, it's that's the, the I, part. I do I do I do like that little test they did of you know give, tell me your names right you know this idea of course like a truly joined trill would immediately rattle off every partnership you know every symbiotic going relationship right. going all the way back right and and so the leader eventually between these two extremes of the the one that sees her as the future the other one sees her an abomination the leader's decision is um, oh, and wants to take out the symbiont right which would yeah. kill the host right. Uh, the leader says, your presence here is destructive to the only thing we have left, our ideals, and so you have to leave. That makes no sense to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> how is that, how is her presence destructive to their ideals? Like, it, it all, it also, well, she, I guess you could say we've got this balance or something between these two idealistic viewpoints and you're upsetting mm-hmm. that balance. But this decision is arrived at remarkably quickly. Yes. I mean, really, it's like, okay, let's set up a commission to study and debate this. Right. And, well, you know, we'll be it'll be a few months. Well, again, you got you got to have that. You have to have the, you know, the evil religious conservative who has a conversion of heart to the, the, the good liberal conser- or liberal religious view. You know, right. I mean, that, that's really what it is. By the end. Yeah. Well, yeah, they, but uh, this decision is essentially made on the, you know, the doorstep of the official greeting space or whichever it is, you know, like, we, we, nope, uh, we're, we're good. See you later. Um, yep. Anyway, they, they, as I mentioned before, Adira and Burnham are, are walking dejectedly sort of back to the shuttle, except not. Um, They're being led by some trill who yeah. and Michael realizes we're not being led back to the shuttle. Right. So bad, bad guy who wants to take the symbiont away from Adira uh, decides to do it by force and uh, that they get attacked. And Burnham, of course, uh, uh, I keep saying demobilizes them. Super super space jujitsu's everybody and blasts them and we're okay now. Yes. And now the spiritual leader shows up and he wants to help and takes them to the sacred caves of Trill. Which um, they did a good job making it look like they did back in the DS9. Yes, I was going to say they look lot, very similar, of course, updated with new, you know, new whiz bang special effects. But we recognize it. Uh, meanwhile, Saru is quizzing the computer for ways to help the crew. We saw this last season where or before, I don't know if it was last season, where Saru, when he's trying to figure out how to lead, he asked the computer. First season. That was first season, right? So he asked the computer for help, and so he's asking the computer for ideas for how to help the crew with this problem that Hugh brought up to him. And the Sphere AI starts responding. And in fact, it's it responds in the voice of the AI Zora, from, Zora, the AI from Calypso. So we find out now that the AI Zora in Calypso is the Sphere data merging with the Enterprise. Enterprise, sorry. Discovery. Discovery's computer. Uh, it's, 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 it's wishful thinking. Yeah, and this this he immediately orders a level ten diagnostic, and but I'm sorry, your computer is glitching bad, dude. Yeah, <laughs> and I wouldn't trust anything it says at this point. Right, and you know, it, it, trust is earned, and when your computer suddenly changes its personality. That's a major sign mm-hmm. that there's something wrong that you need to get figured out. So mm-hmm. he he's entirely too trusting. 
So yeah. of what the computer tells him. Basically, it makes two suggestions. One of them is give everybody the night off, and the other is uh, get your bridge crew together for dinner. Right. Uh, now, this is the problem. Another problem we had, like I mentioned before, you can't on a sh- on a ship. You you can't give everyone the night off. Someone's got to keep things running. You have to have oh, a. You can just put it all on crew. autopilot. You yes. just put it all on autopilot. Of course. Yeah. That's, that's, if, if you could, then now, why don't you have a crew? <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if by the end of the season, the spear data will take over the computer completely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, probably. Pretty clear. Yeah, I think so. Um, so Saru has Thanksgiving dinner with his uh, <laughs> the crew. Uh, My they... dinner with Saru. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's a good one. They hold they hold a ceremony of some sort to recall their choice to follow Burnham through their wor- the wormhole. Uh, they all say I sequentially. Yes, and yep. then Giorgio, uh, who I, I've begun, I've come to love because she punches a hole in their excessively inflated ceremony. It's like one of these team building exercises like a corporate team building exercise uh <laughs> <laughs> the dinner then falls apart when they start making haikus and detmer gives one that attacks stamets for his self-important arrogance most inappropriate haiku ever <laughs> wow <laughs> yes. we get we get really i mean he she and she's still been continued to be wiggy yes yeah and and we and at first she's obsessing about his blood being mm-hmm. on the floor of sick bay. Right. And yeah. it makes no sense. It's like this is some weird psychological fixation of hers. Yes. And and then she goes after him personally when right. he starts to push back on this is inappropriate. And the two of them go after each other. Right. And he, he goes after her because she views him as being this super important savior navigator guy. And he views her as a barely competent pilot. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and she feels like everyone, ever since the Spore Drive, he's been getting all this credit for these amazing stunts they've been pulling off, when in reality, she's had to save the ship repeatedly and nobody yep. is paying attention to her. And I like that Oakun stands up for her Yep. A- yep. after Stamet storms off. But Oakun stands up for her and says, they should thank you for what you've done on this ship. Right. right. And Oakun, who sits next to her, sees what she does every day mm-hmm. and so, and recognizes the contribution that Detmer is making, even though Stamets is sucking all the oxygen out of the room. Yeah. Right. Um, so this is this is this was fairly interesting. It was also very awkwardly written. Yeah. But psychologically, yeah. well, it was fairly interesting. Well, it, it, it's, it's been clear since the second episode where Discovery came through the, the wormhole and all that, that uh, they're playing it that she's going to have PTSD. And this just kind of reinforces that, that this is kind of her lashing out yeah. with that. Or and controls course, in charge. No, I'm just kidding. I think yeah, my theory no, of control no. is, is off the table. Now. I, 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 it ain't, <laughs> that ain't happening. No, it's this, not. This is, this is very much, I think, an issue. She's got some PTSD from... The Shenzhou from issues Discovery has been through. And of course, the crash landing yeah. definitely did not help that matter either. So yeah. I think that's kind of how they're going to they're going to play that. It's true. Uh, I do like how it ends because Giorgio, as if, after everyone storms out, Giorgio says, well, at least the wine was good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and she's walk, walking off with a carafe yeah. of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Uh, so uh, meanwhile, back in the secret caves of Makala on Trill, uh, Adira is unable to, she's, you know, floating in the, uh, in the pool and she's unable to make this connection with the symbiont, uh, because she has a, some sort of rep- repressed memory related to the joining that she has to yeah. get, get through. Um, and so they're going to put her into a state known as communion. Yeah. Um, and that causes her to get instant super cataracts that block out even the irises of her eye, of <laughs> yes. her human eyes. Yeah. Yes. And sinks. Uh, you know. Yeah. And, and sinks. Yeah. She really re- she reacts badly to it. She starts convulsing and then sinks yeah. underneath the pool. And Michael get, goes in there and says she's gone. And it's like, what? Is this an oubliette where she's like <laughs> sunk into a lower <laughs> chamber under the water or something? Well, I mean, it, it looks like a little swimming pool with filled with sort of milky water. Yeah, yeah. it's like a hot tub. And uh, so Burnham then does the whole uh, cataract eye sinking into the pool thing, thing which After i'm not sure some neur- neural stimulator or something like that they call them where they're right. basically like light probes they stuck in the water to kind of help her 
help her link do, up do the thing because she doesn't have a symbiont I, at this point i'm kind of wondering and i it is we could probably discuss it in ds9 even uh but we, how, I'm kind of curious how Trill symbiosis began. Was was this always a willing thing? Were, were they parasites to begin with? Did we ever fought, have we ever been told that in not a, not in the show? But they were told they're a symbiotic species, which suggests they've been doing this all their recorded history. And I can buy that. Um, the uh, I mean, our human ancestors did trepanation. In right. the Paleolithic mm-hmm. age, where they drill holes in people's heads. So I can easily imagine Trill Paleolithic ancestors. It's like, hey, let's put a one of these things in somebody. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This, this thing seems to have an affinity for, for you. Let's put you it know, in if that they were little... worship, worshiping them or something, yeah. they could easily right. say, hey, let's, you know, merge with the god. And, and that's how it started. In the TNG episode, the host, they were, there was a pouch. But there is mm-hmm. there is there still a pouch in Trills in DS9 or is that is it an operation where they have to cut you open? It's an it, operation, yeah. but it looks kind of like a pouch. OK. All right. Was, we get, saw that with uh, with Jadzia's uh, implantation from Curzon. Right. Right. Yeah. They they did change some things from TNG to DS9, I think, which for the and better. For, fortunately. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that was fortunate. Uh, so uh, meanwhile, in inside her head, uh, Adira is having this memory thing in this weird um, space. Interest, interesting visualization yeah. of the Trill headspace or the symbiont headspace. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, well, like it was these... interesting, too. Is, you know, they, would, they would react to how Adira would, would respond. And when she was offense, when she was fighting against it, they were almost like snake-like sounds, you know, hissing. And, right. But then when she was open to it, it was more like puppy, like, a, you know, the, the high pleasing sound you know happy sounds as she would respond right to these these threads yeah. coming at her yeah and and it's basically a, an environment of lots of weird looking threads that are trying to merge with her if she stays in one place too long and she it perceives them as a threat but really what it's trying to do is complete the integration process right right and help with the the memories so she remembers in in there, she these the memories start coming through when she connects with the the threads, the the visualization of the the, the symbiont. Um, she remembers her trill boyfriend that they were on a generation ship looking for the Federation, who, who, whose whose name was Gray, even though mm-hmm. he had blue hair. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, and uh, he was a host about to receive the symbiont of Tall, so uh, the Admiral Tall eventually, um, and an accident. So, so the idea is probably that he did. He did receive it. Yeah. Yes. Well, her, but, her first memories are when he's about to, yeah. and then he does. Right. I was going to say he was probably receiving the symbiont because Admiral Tall must have been leading the generation ship. He must have been on that generation ship, having left Earth, um, um, having given the message. Don't think so. Don't. So think how did? So. so how did the Admiral Tall, who had let, sent the message from Earth twelve years previously, get on the get to that? Well, ship? we 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 do know that he died on that ship. Because it talks about that he left Earth and died on a ship two years before. And I'm not that's sure. When... I'm not sure we know he left. I, I th- he could have sent the the message on his no, way the... to Earth because he said he'd wait on Earth, and then maybe he died in route. Well, the, he sent the message twelve years before, and then he died two years. Oh, okay. Previously. On the okay. ship, sure. Yeah, yeah. So in any case, uh, Tall Tall was on the ship, and Gray becomes the or host. At least this the symbiont was. Yes. Yeah. 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 Tall the tall the, the tall symbiont. Uh, Gray becomes the host, uh, and um, he gets injured in an accident, uh, and so he has to, Basi- has to basically a big meteor smashes the ship. Yes, uh, yep. deflectors are offline apparently. And so he has to ask her to be the host because there's no other. Mm, no, trill? they don't say that. She just up and volunteers to be the host and protect all the memories of yeah. the former host. Oh, OK. It went by kind of yeah, she, quick. So I yeah, she, she she agreed. And so then the the uh, medical droids have said, OK, we're going to do the surgery now. OK. Because okay. uh, Gray would not survive either right. way. Right. So. Uh, at the so significantly at the end of all of this is the only time is the first time she calls herself I am Adira Tall so uh, mm-hmm. she has become the the joining so that having gone through these repressed memories uh, f- you know uh, in, in 
incorporated them into her. She ends up meeting in her mentally, in her mental space, all of the previous hosts, along with Burnham. Burnham is there and experienced it with her. Yep. Uh, and she meets all them the all. hosts, including Gray. Including so she Gray. gets re- reunited with him. Right. And Senatal. Right. Mm-hmm. And so when she's asked this time, having come out of the pool and she's now uh, conscious, she's asked, you know, to uh, tell tell us your names. And she gives them all Takasha Tal, Jovertal, Madalatal, Karatal, Senatal, Greytal, and I'm Adiratal. So all laid out there. Yeah. And, and this kind of is like the reemergence rite that we saw Jadzia go through on right. DS9. Yes. Where she gets to meet each of her previous hosts in another form. Right. Yes, that's right. Um, which is interesting uh, that that was more in the waking world, whereas this is right. was in the, the there's the, that, uh, that great scene of, of Quark being the, the little old lady brushing her hair. <laughs> yes, mm-hmm. that was pretty good. Uh, I I kept wondering in this whole sequence, because this takes a long time to play out. It does. When are, when are Michael and Adira going to drown? <laughs> yes, because they're underwater this whole time. It, well, it's it's the that, that liquid oxygen from uh, uh, the abyss. That's what. So they're not going to yeah. drown. They're actually reading. They I'm don't kidding. say that. They should I'm say just, that. No, to I'm, us. I'm being sarcastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so when they emerge, the other trill then apologize for how they treated Adira. Of course, they, we've all had a change of heart, um, and they offer to mentor Adira, but she says no. I'm going with Discovery to find the Federation. And uh, and so, OK, well, you know, when you find them, let us know. We may rejoin the Federation mm-hmm. when you come back. The end of that plot line. Yes. Yep. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Tilly comes to Saru and and tries to buck him up after the failure of his dinner party. Yes. Uh, just like on the Mary Tyler Moore show. <laughs> yeah. her, her parties were always awful. Yes. Um, <laughs> then it was a running gag. Uh, then, uh, the computer on, oh, also, um, Detmer goes to Culber and takes him up on his offer of maybe we should have a talk because I, I recognize I'm not okay now. Yep. And then the computer announces on its own, all available crew people go to the shuttle bay for a surprise. And I'm thinking... This is the new unstable AI. Is the surprise going to be decompression? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> surprise! Um, bye. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, just like, oh, why don't you have your bridge crew for a dinner party so you can poison them? I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. Lock this down. Don't yeah. just go with the suggestions <laughs> of the new unexpected AI. You know, given this that doesn't... you had problems with a, with a rogue AI that brought you to the thousand years in the future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. but instead the surprise is showing Buster Keaton silent comedy films, which get the staff to bond in laughter and also Stamets and Detmer hug it out and yes. things are mending with the crew. I'm so glad they yeah. chose these, you know, the Buster Keaton silent film, which is not incorporated in the year 2020 so that they didn't have to yeah. pay licensing yeah, fees exactly. and not something that was actually funny from say, you know, 2020, but <laughs> so I'm just kidding. Buster Actually, Keaton is some fine. of those old silent films yeah. are pretty no, darn funny. No, no, no. Yeah, no, I'm just oh, kidding. Yeah. I'm kidding. It's, the but, general is hilarious. Yeah, I'm just, it's, the, I, I love how like TV shows will often use like very old out of copyright Westerns, you know, silent films as yeah. a way of avoiding the legal issues. Uh, well, uh, that they did that in uh, Calypso with the Betty Boop cartoon. Yes. Yep. Although they did use uh, Singing in the Rain, so they probably, they, they must have paid for that. Mm. So. Unless Paramount owns that. Uh, that's an CBS Paramount, yeah, that maybe. might be. Anyway, so we have uh, everyone apologize from other as, as my notes. And yes, we have. Sorry for your heart, the harsh words. Saru theorizes that because Discovery protected the sphere data, data, sorry, my Boston accent coming out, data, now it protects <laughs> them as the Zora AI. He doesn't call it Zora, but we know it's a Zora AI. Um, and then we end with Burnham and Adira in Adira's uh, quarters. and talking about the algorithm necessary to find the Federation headquarters that Senatal had had in his head, apparently. I'm not sure why you need an algorithm to have coordinates, just have coordinates, but okay. Um, then she... she And she gives him an iPad with... gives Bur- Michael an iPad with the coordinates for the Federation yep, headquarters. Right. Uh, Burnham leaves, and then uh, Adira is seeing Gray present in the room as some sort of mm-hmm. manifestation of this person and neither of them understand why 
she can see him sitting there. But that sets us up for future drama and sacrifice. Yes, yes. They because will be. this is not what a Trill experience is supposed to be like. Right, exactly. Oh. And that's how we end things. So, uh, any thoughts so, on this? So, doc- Doctor Who had Clara Oswald as its impossible girl, and <laughs> here we have Adira Tall as uh, Star Trek's impossible girl. Right. So, how is she implausible? Let me count the ways. <laughs> um <laughs> She apparently has a probability manipulation field because so many improbable things occur around this character. Mm -hmm. Um, Number one, she's on a generation ship that gets hit. Yes. You know, that's very (laughs) improbable on its own. Number two, uh, there apparently are no other trill on the generation ship. Yes. How is it a generation ship if you don't have a trill breeding population? Right. You have one trill. Um, <laughs> yeah. So 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 either um, there are no other trill on this generation ship, which is improbable, or they even though there are available trill, they decide what the heck. Let's romantically transfer this thing into you in this in this one time unprecedented, dangerous human host transfer yeah, about this thing that we consider supremely valuable, <laughs> right? And either one of those is improbable. Now, then the uh, ship uh, uh, apparently gets hit again because she they do the surgery, but she her first memories are being in an escape pod, um, or either that, or they're improbably doing the surgery in the middle of an evacuation instead of just putting mm-hmm. everybody in stasis. That's, that's what's going on. Yeah. Then there are no memories of the pre implantation which is improbable of my whole life before the escape pod is gone. Um, then you get to join the earth defense force with no well, background. How does she get to earth? By and, the way, you know, the uh, presumably on the escape pod, well, I'm, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm skimming over that. I'm not <laughs> yeah. listing every conceivable improbability. Here. <laughs> okay. Um, but she gets to join the earth defense force with no background. She then m- manages to, not have a medical scan that detects the symbiont when she joins the Earth Defense Force. And she just happens to get assigned in the Earth Defense Force. This is like the Earth Defense Force is a planetary defense force. It covers, based on its name, all of the defense needs of the planet. And yet Adira happens to get assigned to the boarding party for approaching Federation ships. And she happens to be on duty. It's her duty rotation when Discovery shows up. And then she somehow skates around the explanation for the transporters being disabled and re-enabled without being fingered as the one who caused that. And she's somehow allowed to leave with the Discovery crew. Also, she's flagrantly (laughs) violating the Trill reassociation rule with Gray after Gray gets implanted. Well, I actually, OK, no, maybe not no, on that no, one. No. Yeah, um, because she because since there was an implantation previously. Yeah. But it, there's just this overall pattern of none of this stuff with Adira is at all improbable. Is not at all. Probable. Is it all probable? Right. It, it's yeah. all incredibly improbable. And I that's weak character writing. Now, the only the only one I would take issue on that is the issue of the actual implantation as far mm-hmm. as. In the original middle of the surge, as we, we commented on, Gray was going to die. Tal was mm-hmm. still viable. There was an emergency. However, yes, I agree with you. Then after that, there wasn't another trill available to reimplant mm-hmm. later. You know, like there was with the issue with Riker. We talked about right. that before. Yeah. We, you and, know. I, and I recognize that this, the timing of the surgery and the, the vessel damage is the weakest one of those. But still, the yeah. overall yeah. pattern is just incredibly improbable and that makes for weak writing i do like though that they hung a lantern on one of the series most annoying ticks because they had adira tell michael don't say anything annoyingly inspirational that makes me nuts (laughs) and that shows recognition on the writer's parts that they have a problem with their characters saying annoyingly inspirational things right right yeah well then they they play play on that a little bit more it's like well say something inspirational 
don't screw this up or something like <laughs> yeah, that. I can't yeah, remember yeah. exactly how, yeah. how they put it, but yeah, there, there are some, there are some good moments in this episode, like as we've pointed out, but yeah, the, the, it feels like we've decided we need to get this character Adira on the ship as quickly as possible. And we're just going to ram it through any improbabilities and get her on board uh, in this, in this episode, these two episodes, uh, because we only have 10 episodes of this season and she just right. needs to be there and established by episode five. I mean, it really kind of feels that way. So, yeah. Well, it, it you also weak. you also forgot one more improbability there, Jimmy. Two episodes ago, the shuttles weren't available, so they had to walk across this foreboding <laughs> yes. landscape. But now they got shuttles, so they're good now. But not transporters. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I, I complained about that. That's just that's not one connected with Adira directly. Yeah. I know. Yeah. 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 More improbabilities. All right. Uh, so I think that that should do it for now uh, on this episode. We do have some feedback, listener feedback, and I wanted to, uh-huh. to share. Uh, Casey Taylor sent us an email and says, uh, much as I hate to admit it, you guys nailed it reviewing Discovery's third episode of the new season, People of Earth. And I only say hate to admit it because I want the series to be the best it can be. I enjoyed the episode, but definitely felt some nagging questions. And you pinpointed several of them with the plot holes. But you made it more important, a, a more important observation about the show, and it gets to something I've been pondering when contrasting Discovery with The Mandalorian, the, the new Star Wars series. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Star Trek shows definitely tilt quite far into tell over show. In other words, the old mm-hmm. adage, don't tell, show. Whereas The Mandalorian does an excellent job with show, don't tell. Star Trek struggles to tell stories without explaining and re-explaining the point it wants to make. And that was very much on display in that episode of Discovery. And once again, in this episode of Discovery 2, unfortunately. Yes. So, um, what what do you think? Yeah. I I would agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, Star Trek has a problem with over-explaining and using narrative to bridge improbabilities. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael Shibon is a a good writer. And I've read some of his books. He's the showrunner for for Discovery. He doesn't mm-hmm. write every episode. He doesn't write every script, but he's the showrunner. And I feel like he's better than that. <laughs> like he's good at show don't tell. So I don't understand why Discovery is doing this, except with I I kind of feel like this is a, a an artifact of not completely because, like I said, the Mandalorian manages it. But it's a, a partially an artifact of the 10 episode uh, season that we we've kind of uh, saddled with these days with a lot of shows well, when you have 20 we, something episodes you can you have time to tell a story well especially when you're doing it as a story arc you know because we see this with new who as well where it can get into right um telling a lot more the doctor rambles off a whole bunch of plot points that they could have shown if they had another episode or two to actually show it right right but the you mandalorian know. like i said the mandalorian manages to to do it without having to you know, narratively unload on us. So, well, and that's partly because it's it's really a choice as a writer of how much do you want to try to take on in the space available. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you if you want to ramp the story up to massive stakes, you've you've got less space to do that in, and you're going to rely on verbiage more. Like this substance is fourteen times stronger than diamond. You know, is right. that? Okay, that's just verbiage to ramp up the drama. Right. Just show us beating his fists on a hard wall. (laughs) Right. That's all you need to do. Right. Right. Um, And and so so if you keep the stakes lower, you don't have to engage in as many improbabilities and you don't have to engage in as much verbiage. And it also the artifact is they're trying to do a lot more in this series. With The Mandalorian, mm-hmm. you have one thread that you're following, the main character and his yeah. sidekick. Mm-hmm. Whereas in this, you've got half a dozen different story threads going. You have the main one, then you have like two or three B plots, you know, that, you've, that you're trying to sustain. And so you don't have as much time to do it. You be, so you have to take shortcuts. They're also trying to do psychologically complex stuff in a short space because yes, they're right. trying what they're trying to do is in in this episode is explore the psychology of Adira mm-hmm. and Burnham and every member of the crew <laughs> that we see yeah, right. all at once. Yeah, that's and true. their complex relationships and they end up making stupid mistakes well, in the writing as a result. Well, especially with the crew, they're kind of making up two for two seasons where they didn't do a very good job of that right. yeah. to begin with. I mean, season one, we, we commented at the end of season one, 
Who How are many these bridge people? crew members <laughs> did we actually know? Yes. Who are these people? And by people? end of season two, we start to know Detmer and some of the other ones. Yeah. But it's just like, now they're trying to make all that up, you know, make up for all of that. Right. And it, this, the writing obviously suffers because of it. Yep. That's true. Well, uh, Casey, thank you very much for your your email. We, yeah. We'd love to get feedback yep. from listeners and uh, gives, cause us some good discussion. So thank you. All right, well, let's wrap things up there. We want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Michael E., Adam B., Mark B., Nellie B., and Lynn Z. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So, what do you think of this episode of Discovery Forget Me Not? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Media, or send an email to trek at sqpn.com. And we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the next episode of Discovery titled Die Trying. Until then, Father Cory Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Don. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thank you, and live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, don't say anything annoyingly inspirational. <laughs> <laughs>